I'm yeah. not going to cap to you. So first, I want to say I was wrong. It, it is okay <laughs> to admit your <laughs> mishaps in thinking. I definitely was wrong four weeks ago. Wow. But <laughs> going back to what you're saying, I initially joined <laughs> – when I initially joined the wait list, I'm not going to cap. I said I was going to pay at max $12, and I'm still yep. not going to pay this $20. And the reason why I'm not going to pay it is because I know how much it costs them. And I've ran the numbers on how often I use it. And if I was to use their API by itself, guess what? It costs me less than a dollar. So why the fuck am I paying you 12 Yo, what's going on, guys? Not much, man. <laughs> it's been a crazy week. <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's been a crazy week for sure. But do we expect anything less? <laughs> Just how the, this year has started off? Nah, that's that facts. You know, that... January over the last couple of years has been hot. Like, you know, like the year before, like COVID was started hitting around January. This January, things has been hot, man. I don't know. Going into the new year is always a little spicy, man. This week, bro, I crazy. So I got a storage unit that I own. It's through public storage. And so I don't really go to it that much, but like I just, I needed to go to it uh, yesterday because I'm going skiing this weekend. So I needed to get some ski stuff and I pull up in my, I pull up to the storage unit and I'm walking up to my unit and my lock is gone. Like my store, the lock on my storage unit is what? gone. There's a different lock on my storage unit. I'm like, I'm looking around my girl with me and I'm like, I know I haven't, I know we haven't been here in a while, but I, I didn't forget where our storage unit is. I'm panicking now because I'm like, wait a minute. Like, do we pay the bill? Cause I'm like, I told my girl, I'm like, let, like check the bank real quick. Like, like, did, do we pay the bill? Cause I didn't get no phone call, no email, no text message, nothing. So I'm like, we didn't get evicted out of here. So I run down to the office and I'm like, like, what's going on? Like, there's no lock on our storage. I mean, there is a lock on our storage unit, but it's not the lock that we put on there. And they're like, oh, yeah, back in December, somebody broke in and broke in a bunch of storage units and basically ransacked a bunch of storage units, took a bunch of stuff. We called y'all, but y'all didn't answer. And I'm like, what? I had no phone call, no voicemail. Email you, though. Bro, Yo, I, had no email you, though. I had nothing. I don't know. I don't know. Nothing. Bro, they hey, didn't ransack. they called you. How would you know that? <laughs> bro, they ransacked our unit, bro. Like went all through it, like it was bad, bro. Like they they ransacked through a bunch of them, like it was crazy. It felt, to me, it feels like an inside hold job. On, I don't on, know bro. the details. At least have your skis though. Your bag. You have your skis at least. Yeah, no, I got all that stuff. I'm good there. I'm good there. Okay, 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 okay. All right. How the hell did they get in there? So I asked the same question. <laughs> so apparently, the lady who was working there at the time that I went, she's new. In which she is new. I haven't seen her before. She was like, they came in through a back door. So some back door, they were able to break in and came in and like, they had a fill time, like going through those storage units. I mean, imagine none, of, I'm like, none of the cameras was working. Y'all ain't got no internal alarm system, nothing, like nothing. You they get what? more I'm phone calls lie. when you miss a payment. <laughs> yeah, they do. They do. You're going to get email every bro, other day. Everything, bro. They're going to come to the house and knock on the door, bro. You miss a payment, bro. Somebody break in your storage unit and they don't do nothing. It's crazy, man. But hey, okay, we good, man. We got insurance. Wrong, but correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. But there are some storage units. So I had a storage unit in LA a couple of years ago. And I still I have a different one now. I use a clutter. So they, you know, they just handle it all. I don't even know where my stuff is at, but they just deliver it when I need it, you know? But when I have my storage unit, like you didn't like anybody can get in, like anybody can get in. It was just like a, like, like, you know, yeah, um, a car couldn't get in, a car couldn't get in, but like a person, anybody, any person can get in easy. So I don't How? know. If it was... They had like a master key or something? No, it was just, open. I'm talking about like, like just to get into the rooms with the locks. Mm. Like, oh, like, you know what yeah, you're talking about. Yeah, you can just walk in. So I mean, yeah, if, I don't know if it was like that at y'all's, but like the one I that I used to go to in LA, you could just walk in. Like if you didn't have a car, you could just walk into the storage unit, go on the elevator, go up. You didn't need no key card, nothing. You just go upstairs, and there'll just be a bunch of storage units left to the right. And I mean, if you know how to, you know, break locks, then I mean, yeah, you know. And then there's one person that has a truck that does have a car. I mean. Yeah, 
It's crazy. The one that we use, there is actually a gate around it, right? Like it has a gate around it. It closed at six o'clock. Like you think it's so secure, but apparently it's not like they don't have as much building security as I thought they did. I mean, this is public storage. This is not like some random storage facility, some local facility. Public storage is probably the largest U.S. public storage, self-storage company in the country. You know what I'm saying? So you would think like the biggest ones would have like, nah. In fact, I, I don't even know why I believe that because I worked at big companies. You worked at big companies. The biggest companies we have in the worst internal security, the worst internal systems. Hey, hold up. Hold up, bro. Them niggas are doing close to two and a half billion dollars in bro. revenue. They're big. They They're can't big. have that security. They're big. Oh, they sounds can. Like a business, they can. Sounds, they sounds, like a business oppor- sounds like a business opportunity for somebody because like they need it. That's <laughs> wild, bro. But hey, we, man, so now we got go to go through this to you, man. Now we got to go through the insurance process and they want us to prove our stuff. I'm like, y'all tripping. But hey, it is. about insurance companies, you pay them every month, right? You pay insurance companies every month. And the point is, if something happens, they're going to take care of you, right? Yep. But whenever something happens, they got two, they got so many questions. It's almost like, <laughs> it's almost like, it's like, wait, what am I paying for exactly? If y'all going to fight me with something that happens. <laughs> you just pan to adjust their risk profile. That's, that's all you. That's all you really pan for. That's all an insurance business is a cash cow. That's probably the greatest scam of the century. I think honest. it's a scam, but you know what it is. Also, too, they are also targets of a lot of scammers. So it's like I think what happens is like it's like insurance itself is like in a lot of ways a scam because they it's just they just. A lot of them are, are, it's difficult to get your, get, you know, what you are owed, you know, without like a bunch of different, you know, proof and stuff that you might not have. But people do target insurance companies and people are always lying to insurance companies. I'm not going to lie. I, I mean, you know, how many times have we, you know, heard stories about like, you know, people getting accidents and, you know, do their own yeah. little mistake, but, you know, they make it seem like there's something else going on. I mean, they pay out a lot. So it's like, it, but that, that, at, that makes it harder for everybody else, though, because then now, like, when you genuinely got your stuff stolen, then now they're just like, yeah, you know. Well, uh, well, speaking of scam man, have y'all heard about yes. that? The founder of Frank. <laughs> so I hadn't heard about Frank. I hadn't even heard of the app Frank at all, or this founder, but the founder of Frank, who sold her company to Chase for one hundred and seventy-five million, and apparently Chase oh, they ain't even suing- gonna let me pull it up. Oh, they, oh, they got the paywall. What? Wait, hold on. Forbes? I didn't. I didn't even. I didn't even know that. What? That's Forbes. Hold on. We gonna we we got to Yeah. Put, a paywall. What a paywall. When they start That's doing ridiculous. that? Okay, ridiculous. we got the information. Okay. Okay. Right, cool, so right so there. okay. So she sold her company. What was this back in 2021, I believe, to Chase for 175 million. And at that time, Chase, their rationale, they kind of did a press release about it, and their rationale was that. They felt like this, like, you know, purchasing Frank was a unique opportunity for, a, you know, deeper engagement with over 5 million students and over 6,000 institutions. And so just as a quick rundown, so Chase essentially is a college financial planning company targeting college students. And so I, I guess, I don't know, this is the article that describes it, but essentially Chase, the way they found out that a lot of the user accounts were fake was that they tried to send marketing emails to a batch of users to a batch of about 400,000 customers and 70% of those emails bounced. <laughs> and so, yeah. so the founder is actually arguing in a countersuit that Chase made up reasons to fire her late last year to avoid paying her millions of dollars. So she's arguing that, you know, she didn't do anything wrong. Chase, you know, is trying to make up stuff to fire her. Chase is saying, look, we sent a marketing, you know, blast off to 400,000 of these 5 million customers that you claim you have. Is seventy percent of those emails bounced? Like, what's going on? And you got one hundred and seventy-five million like dollars from us. Doesn't it sound like she's deflecting now? What does sound uh, like something? Buying her have to do with her? You know, writing all these false accounts. Well, that's what she's saying. She's saying that she didn't provide the false account. She's saying that Chase is making up this narrative in order to cause a bunch of hysteria around her and to try to get her fired. Well, you know, obviously she's no longer with them. Hold that's up. what her argument is. This- that's what her argument is. What's their, what's, okay, okay, I understand her defense. She has to defend herself, obviously, you know, whether, you know, let's just say she's innocent. I don't know, you know what I'm saying? But, like, I don't understand why Chase would care so much about her in particular that they would put out, like, this level of, like, 
effort on this one acquisition. You know what I'm saying? Like, like it kind of just seems like it, it, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, it seems. What do you mean more, when you say care that much? Like, what do you? Speak? What I mean is that J.P. Morgan Chase is a extremely. I mean, they're literally the bank. They're, they're literally a bank, right? And so, like, I mean, they acquired this company, cool, and you know, and they, like, whatever reason they have for wanting to fire her, like, let's say it was like they just whatever reason it is. I don't see why they would go as far to basically say her whole company was fraudulent to do that. Like, 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 is it like, I, like, it just seems like Chase is such a much, I mean, they manage, I can imagine Chase holds billions and billions of dollars. I mean, this is, a, a, this is, this acquisition was probably less than a billion. I'm sure. You know what I'm saying? So like this, it just seems strange that they would make a whole narrative to pin it on her. Keep it a stock with you. It's the same reason. Like, I don't know. I, Cause it, it, this has been my experience being around like, wealthy people is don't get me wrong niggas like to spend money the way they need to spend money and it's probably less than one percent of what ever you know their net worth may be but at the end of the day guess what them niggas are still being very intentional about how they spend and you know like they're trying to make sure them purchases actually line up like you didn't get you didn't get to that point of being you know, a billionaire or in this case, a billion dollar company by letting little shit like this slide by. So like, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know if I'm a hundred percent behind like your argument of just because they're big, they should. No, you're actually saying what I'm saying then that you're saying basically then she, you're, you're, it's almost like you're saying she did do something. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm not buying her defense. That's, oh, no, we're not buying her defense. Like, I don't understand. Like if she is truly innocent, why would Chase go to this level? You know what I'm saying? Like a hundred percent. It's possible. But don't get me wrong. You know, companies drill down on people and create stories and false narratives, you know, all the time. You know what I'm saying? Like people get blamed for things they didn't do. But it just seemed like it would be strange that she didn't do anything and then trace out of all. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, we'll drill down on her. Well, well this so is Chase. what they're, they're, they said. I was going to read this real quick. So this is yeah, what they said. They said she first asked her engineering chief to create fake customer details in quotes. So that means they have proof of her like saying this. So it's probably email or something stupid using algorithms, smart, smart, bot. this dude was smart. He refused. So she went to a New York college and asked a data science professor to create the accounts. Then what actually got her caught was the banking included incriminating emails between the professor and Jefferson suit. So they have the bank details of all this. And then they have, you know, Wording of her asking a professor, will the fake emails look real with an eye check or better to use unique ID? <laughs> uh, see, what's crazy to me is, well, what, I see, what, why would she have to go to a professor in order to get those accounts created? Like, she could have went off site. She could have went to India. She could have went to, I mean, she could have went to any international place guys, and, like, got some developers yo, to do that. Guys, guys, Dre, that, that, but let me go even further. Like, I'm going to be real. Like, as like me reading this with a hacker mindset, an engineering mindset, you know, they're saying they sent 400,000, however many emails and they yeah, 400, that. Right? My, my thing is you could have simply, I mean, if you're going to scam, do it right. Right. You could have simply just got a ton of emails. Rodney, don't incriminate that, yourself. That were real and just use real names. And then like, like then it would have went through it. They would not have bounced back. Why use fake emails? I don't understand why you use fake emails. <laughs> People, like, I'm actually I'm saying. curious. This girl's what was her background? Do you know any of that, Dre? I didn't even. I didn't look too far into her background. I didn't. I just saw the headline. I'm like, the whole I'm assuming she probably it. wasn't like a technical person. I mean, she's clever. I mean, give her that she, is she? Uh, she mean, I mean, she finessed a hundred and seventy five million dollar exit. She must be. Yeah, no, not, but <laughs> but, let, <laughs> but yeah, let's you got to give her talk that. about that because. <laughs> No, nah, and this is the thing we need to talk about, too, is if you historically look at these financial crimes, because that's what this is. True. Them niggas pay what? A very small percentage. Like, I remember, have y'all watched the documentary of the college scandal and how that dude made tens yes. of millions of dollars, you know, getting the rich? Yeah. Guess what? That nigga's not in jail. And that nigga, that nigga had, I want to say he had to no, pay, he, it, it, no, it, he it was like one or two though. million dollars. No, he just got sentenced. Oh, though. he did he just, just got... get sentenced? Yeah, his name is Rick Singer, I think. If you Google, let's Google it real quick. I think he just got, yeah, he just got a couple years, I think. Okay. Okay. 
a couple okay. of years. I, don't, I, I mean, I don't, know how, I don't know about the restitution part, though. I don't know if he had to pay any money back, but I did think he he had a crazy. No, he had to pay. Like, I didn't even know a lot. He had that. to pay a few mins, millions, but he got. You should watch it. Oh, you it should watch it. Last highly recommend. Okay, my fault. Was, my fault. It was good. Yeah, I just saw the headline. Though, so, yeah, I believe it's on Netflix. I want to say Netflix. Netflix. Okay, it's well made. What's it called though? Oh, it's fire. Varsity it's like, Varsity Blues. Okay, yeah. Cool. But, but, but hold up. That nigga made $30 million. He only had to pay back 10. The fuck? That's crazy. That's a slap on the wrist. That's almost equivalent <laughs> to like how they penalize these drug companies that sell fentanyl and open all these drugs out into the community, make $20 billion and be like, oh, we're going to hit you with the highest fine, $3 billion. Like, okay. That's a rounding error. To the, I'm paying to the, that. <laughs> yeah. It's so easy. Then it's the tax. Bro, exactly. that's, a so risk. For that's part of the tax. risk. That's part of the risk model that they bake into it when they go to market with these. Like, we're never going to get backlash. We're never going to get sued. So what's the risk model to that? Like, you know, how many people are going to die? Facts. Right? Like, like, how many people can we afford to let die before it gets too crazy? Facts. And, and it's wild and unfortunate. It's crazy that it has to be that way. Yeah. And actually, you know, r- real quick, not to get too far off, the, far off of the drug companies, but you know, one thing I will say is when I went to Mexico and I realized that you could just walk into a drugstore, just like how, like the equivalent of a CVS and walk in and buy whatever you want. I mean, I'm talking about like, you can walk in and buy coding. You can walk in Nigga, what? and buy a Percocet. <laughs> Nigga, I promise you. And, and it made me realize like something interesting when I was just like, there is a, something strange going on in America and it's not just about protecting the people from side effects. Mm-hmm. It's a huge business around a lot of the ways that we are distributing drugs and it doesn't actually have to be that way. And it's interesting, but I'm going to just leave, I'm gonna, for now, I'll just leave it at that. Maybe another conversation. No, no. In a future episode, I think we should definitely unpack that, man. Yeah, it's strange. It's just like, but at the same time, it's like, it puts responsibility into the adults. You know what I'm mm. saying? Like, like, you know, if you have something going on, maybe you should just get some antibiotics. Why do you have to first, one, have insurance, which is costing you either through directly or through your job or through the government? And, or, and then on top of that, you got to schedule an appointment with your doctor, get basically to get his permission so that you could use it. But what, what if the doctor is wrong? You know, what if the doctor is wrong? And then, so basically you're at the mercy of the whole thing. And, and there's so much to it, man. But so, yeah. We'll unpack it, but let's go back to th- this woman though. So, so what are your predictions? That's what I'm curious about. So, 100, 175, that's what she got. What's she paying back? She's gonna have to return uh, all that. Like, she's going to prison. Yeah, she's, yeah. Gonna, she, she's done. Like, like Cause, cause Chase is gonna put the pressure on her. They got the lawyers. This is mm-hmm. nothing. They can just they can drag this out as long as they want to and put as much pressure on her as they and want. And I think they're offended too. I think they took that personal. Oh, yeah. I think oh, because yeah. how did that how did that get through due diligence? Cause they don't mm. look, man. They don't look. They don't look, man. Can you unpack that? Because yeah, people I, under. I, I don't. I don't want to make the assumption that people understand what due diligence is when okay. it comes to like investors and yeah. all that. So okay. help us I, understand. I'll say it quick. You know, typically speaking, when you're either selling a stock to investors or or you're selling stocks, period. So when I say selling stocks, you might be pitching an investor and they're trying to invest in your company, you know, or, or you're selling the company to either the public or you're selling the company to another company. There's typically a process where after both parties have agreed that, okay, this is something we want to do, there's another step. And that step is called due diligence, right? And the purpose of that step is to go through, you know, relevant information about the business to make sure that, there is no like just bullshit. Make sure there's no bullshit. You know, let's just look through like just you know financials, maybe some information, give me some data. You mm-hmm. know, here's the thing though, and I want to add on to what I said about not they didn't check. I will say this: founders, for example, early stage founders, when they actually start raising money and they and, and, you know for you know with their fundraising process they actually start to realize that there's less due diligence than you would think. You mm. kind of think that, you know, when somebody is about to send you $300,000, that they would actually ask you for a significant amount of information. And that has not been the case. You know, like that has not been the case with me, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot of trust in this business. And it needs to, there needs to be a lot of trust in this business, you know, because it gets weird 
Racing for weird. What were some of the things they asked you for, like when y'all raced? Man, I'm not like gonna lie, man. Like I was asked for nearly nothing. So, 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 I like, like on my side, people didn't ask for anything, to be honest. And you know, luckily for us, we did have the technology. We had all the stuff ready to show, but nobody ever asked for it. Nobody ever asked for bake statements. Nobody asked if those actual investors actually invested. Everybody just believed. You know, and maybe there was some calls, like, you know, they called it back channeling where, oh, you know, yeah. uh, where, you know, in, in the background, people go and check their references. Or for example, let's say you, you go to an investor and he wants to invest and he realizes that one of the firms that you're saying invested, he didn't know somebody there. So he might go talk to a partner and be like, Hey, you know, I'm about to invest in this company, you know, tell me a little bit about that. And that's like called like back channeling, you know, that's a little bit of, well, that's one of the ways you can back channel. And so, you know, but from a front facing standpoint, I didn't have like almost the only thing people wanted to see is a cap table and the cap table is just a, a spreadsheet. <laughs> like it's like, it's just a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's, it's yeah. not like, it's not simple, no, it's simple not as that. Anything. So, we had the cap table. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> we, we, Jason, yeah, we really at the we, cap we, table. We in the spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> No, you know, what's crazy. My, my process was a little bit different. I didn't have like, we, we didn't have to go through like an extraneous amount of due diligence, but I did have to put together like a, a like a two years of like financial projections, which honestly I thought was a, a complete waste of time, but I was like, fuck it. I'll do it. If you're going to give me a million dollars to do this, fine. I'll do it. And yeah, I did it. And that was that. But like, it, yeah, it was. However, I will say the exercise might have been beneficial, but the document itself mm -hmm. wasn't like what it produced wasn't there. But I will say there was a benefit and I do find value in thinking about the business in that way. And that's why I have like the certain perspective that I have around like how businesses make revenue and how the business model is, which we kind of will get into when we talked about earlier in our group chat. So I do think it was helpful to have me think about the business in that way, because then that allowed me to kind of think more strategically around like, okay, what do we need to do? Like, what do we need to do? And I was able to understand the business at a little bit of a different level had I not necessarily like done that analysis. However, I still think um, like the output of that was not really as useful as I as they probably hoped it would have been. But hey, it is what it is. But I still would have imagined there'd be a little bit more diligence, but it wasn't that much. But you're right though. Like the more money you raise, it is all about the handshake. Like people will wire you a ton of money. Yeah just on handshake alone with nothing signed with nothing that's the game shocking it's shocking and it's all it's usually what it's a part of becoming an insider you know when you're mm. the outsider like you are there's nothing but doubt when you come to mm. the table you know nothing but doubt which is the reason why you know fundraising process requires you know warm intros you know and and then once you start getting those you know quote unquote stamps of approval whether or not you're getting a you know, investment from, you know, ventures, you know, Science, Sequoia, you know, Matt Capital, whoever it is, when you start getting those stamps of approval, people just go with those, you know, they're like, they must have checked. I think what the mindset is like, they must have checked. So, you know, we had nothing to worry about. I never forget when Rotten, this was when we were raising, Rotten gave me this piece of game and he was like, bro, scrap all that shit. It comes down to story. What is the story you can tell? And I think all of that, even going back to due diligence, the reason why there's so less of it is because at the end of the day, like Dre said, it's built on trust. Trust is an emotion. And you being able to trust somebody is literally based on the story you are telling mm -hmm. yourself in your head. Yep. Yes. Yes. And that's why I'm not going to lie. I agree with, you know, I agree with the idea that like, I don't know if anybody, I believe it was Dre that said this too, but she's going to get like, she's. It's over for her because when, first of all, also too, one thing that founders need to understand is that this is, th there is a, there's a part of this game where, you know, you were supposed to sell a vision and obviously a vision is not here today. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're not entirely telling things based on a full reality, right? Now let's change it. But here's the thing. There is something called stretching it too far and going way too far. And for example, in Elizabeth Holmes case, we saw that we've seen that, you know, with a Sam Bankman, you see all these, you know, these fraud mm -hmm. things, they go way over. But here's the thing, when you 
going back to what Brian said, it, the trust is the feeling. When you break that trust, oh, it's personal now. And so Chase, like, Chase doesn't have to drill down on her. It's not that much money to Chase in the in, in, in the grand mm -hmm. thing. So I'm telling you now, yeah. it's personal now. Because they feel like they look stupid. And so now she's not going to, it's not going to be good for her. I can say that much. Yep. Yeah. No, I 100% agree with you. But uh, speaking on, you know, vision, one of the big things that, you know, obviously we've hit on this podcast a few, a few weeks now is, you know, this new vision that AI is creating for our world. And so I know Rodney, you told us, hit the group chat and was like, hey, chat GPT is out. Your girlfriend is obviously taking advantage of it now, but they got a wait list. You want to tell us a little bit more about this and how it's going to work? Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you a little bit more about it. Well, one, first thing I'll say is that I'm slightly offended that my girlfriend got off the wait list before I did. I knew about the wait list before it was even public. <laughs> so I'm just like a little offended that like how that happened. She sent me the screenshot. You know, I'm happy for it. You know, go ahead and sign up for the plus premium, whatever you want to call it, you know, but I should have been first. So I'll say that first. So Sam Altman, like if you hear this, like, like, come on, bro. Like that, I need an apology. <laughs> But here's what I'll say though. I'll say that like Chat GPT Plus is the obvious thing that was coming next, right? Like they launched a product and it was a good product and they started doing both to the point where they couldn't even maintain it to, you know, without it crashing or like, you know, exceeding yeah. like demand, right? And so whenever that happens, naturally, you know, a company is one, they're obviously, you know, dedicating resources to it, but those resources are not free, you know? And I remember actually Dre talking about this a little bit about like, we had a conversation about them. This was the, the our predictions for 2023 yeah, episode. Yeah, like, like what's more important, like, the, <laughs> like, like a hot product or like the, like the infrastructure. And this is an example of something that, that would align with what Dre talking about, right? Which is like, this is a hot product. And it's clear, and now you can, they can slap a subscription on it, and they can expect to get a lot of money concurrent, like recurring for a while. Like, it, like it's not going to be like I don't care what anybody says, they'll be making money off this for a while. One thing that I thought was interesting is so. So by the way, it it's pretty much just allowing people to be prioritized, right? So like, yeah. you know, if you go on during certain times, for example, like the time that I love the most to be on the internet is like at night. A lot of times it's actually at high demand at night, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So there, there are times in which case, if you go on, you know, chat GPT and it's just like, you can't move and move and get what you want. They're saying, Hey, look, you don't have to worry about that anymore. You know, if you pay for this subscription, they're also saying that, you know, the faster version of it, you know, sometimes it takes a while to generate. I'm thinking that they're saying there's a faster generation process for people who are paying and all these things sound amazing i'm definitely going to do the plus, the plus program i would have paid more than 20 dollars a month to be honest but it's good that they got that price now i do want to address something though that i thought was interesting there are people though that think 20 dollars a month or like 20 to 40 dollars a month for chat gpt is expensive and i wanted to know and open it to the floor like what do you guys think about you know, the pricing of, you know, this tool. I'm yeah. not going to cap to you. So first I want to say I was wrong. It, it is okay <laughs> to admit your mishaps and thinking. I definitely was wrong four weeks ago. Wow. But <laughs> going back to what you're saying, I initially joined, <laughs> when I initially joined the wait list, I'm not going to cap. I said I was going to pay at max $12 and I'm still yep. not going to pay this $20. And the reason why I'm not going to pay it is because I know how much it costs them. And I've ran the numbers on how often I use it. And if I was to use their API by itself, guess what? It costs me less than a dollar. So why the fuck am I paying you 12, like okay. 20? Go, okay, okay, yeah. Brian, you got- That's some crazy okay, Now Brian got his off. Brian got his off, go ahead, Dre. I'm on Dre to go now. Cause Brian, I'm, we're, gonna, we're gonna pull this all back around. Yeah. I mean, honestly, give, given what you get for and, you know, not everybody is like technically savvy enough to take the APIs and actually do something meaningful with it. So given like the value that you get, I think $20 is totally reasonable, but I think price is always relative, right? Like it's always relative to the person to, to the situation. You know what I'm saying? Because for some people, $20 a month is a lot. For some people, it's not. For me, it's not. 
Because I pay more than that. I pay thirty dollars a month for gra- for Grammarly, and I've been paying for that for years. I pay thirty dollars mm. a month for Superhuman. So like, I'm a person that already pays a premium for software. So for me, when I see twenty dollars, I'm like, oh, that's a deal. I already said I would pay a hundred dollars. So I'm already getting a discount on top of what I would already be willing to. You pay. was one of them. Oh my bro. gosh. Okay. No, bro. Yeah, Ninety nine dollars, easy, bro. bro. Easy. Bro. Bradley, okay. So so hey, look. Okay, look, look, let's get to it. Let's get to it real quick. Let's get to it real quick. Brian, well, first of all, Brian, you said Dre is one of them. No, you're one of them. Let me explain. <laughs> Let me explain what I'm talking about. You know, the the people that are close to the technology are the ones that are the most critical of the price. Like, 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 like and what like what Dre said though, this is a consumer product. You are looking at the price through the lens of somebody who has been spending hours and hours and hours over the hundred hours, maybe 200 hours studying AI. <laughs> of course you not, of course you're looking at the price a different way that, that that's not. So, so, you know, like it, and then, you know what? I would have paid $200 a month if they had came out with that. And even though I'm an engineer and let me explain why that is. I do not want to use the API. I do not want to go and and do anything manually. (laughs) So I would have paid that, you know, and then also another thing, like another thing, you know, I had a a friend of mine that was like, same thing like you, Brian. He was like, you know, he's been in AI. He's close to it right now. And he was tweeting and I was trying to understand his perspective. He was like, nah, you know, 40 is too high. And I'm like, well, it's the product is still free actually i think people forget like it's not that you cannot use chat gpt if you don't pay you can still use it as if you use it today they're just simply saying you get prioritized if you're paying money right so when people are saying like it's overpriced and whatnot well you actually don't you don't have to pay for it it's free for you you know if since you have all these other tools then you have nothing to worry about as far as the price and i think what people are saying that that know about ai is that there are other tools that are specific and then chat GPT is so general. Why is it so much? The thing is, but what I think is though, is that when you have a general tool though, you actually are more powerful in a lot of ways because you determine how you use the tool, you know, and it's almost like a paintbrush or like a pen, you know, in which case you get to, you know, determine what the picture is or what comes out of it. As opposed to, you know, just I suppose as the of of the alternative, you know, if you have a, you know, a tool that specifically focused on copy, for example, like copy AI, right? That was like a forty dollars a month or something like that. Like it it was very expensive, and all it did was generate text. But you know, like like, and I'm and okay, go ahead. I'm gonna let Brian go. I'm not the reason why those companies got away with that, which is the reason why, like, I think you're gonna see Jasper copy AI and a lot of them start to change, is because there wasn't the awareness around it. And they're like in AI, don't get me wrong, the what these companies like OpenAI, Stability, etc., have done is they've created these foundational models, meaning they've taken on all the costs related to training. So now, because the cost of training is the highest cost of all, the cost of operating it now perpetually is damn near zero. And but so they, that's they the upfront cost. They paid the cost to be the boss. They like I, nobody I, else put the money up. I get it there. I get it there. But this is my other point too, because I want us to be very careful when we use the word general, right? I would not consider Chat GPT general, and the reason why I would not do that is because. It's not good at, it's not good at math. It's not really good at chemistry. Anything that requires critical reason, reasoning and logic, it's, that's not his thing. They came Go ahead. With an update. They address all y'all, they address all y'all niggas. They came up with an update and they said, look, now all the math problems, they are going to work. They yeah. came out with the update. But where was that? Well, people, Bro, hold on. Just, wait, I, wait, wait, one second, one second. When people say what chat GPT can do today, I hate it. Because I'm like judging something based on one inning. We're literally at the right at the beginning. Like it's right there. It's it's right there. So all these little trivial things, math, like, come on, like math, like that's such a simple thing for art. That's such a simple thing for a computer to do. That's the, that, in fact, I would argue a computer is no. probably best at that pure function of but math. So like, that's an easy thing to solve, bro. That's a very easy thing. No, 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 no,
They kept the resources. Update, Brian, I'm telling you. They came I did update. see that. They, they saw that, that too. Because you know what? They heard all the criticism. They yeah, heard I saw all the that criticism. Too. They heard y'all. I'm, I'm going to go check it out because I've been reading the paper. <laughs> I'm going to go check it out. But what I do want to address is this, though. Like, a computer is good at, a math, at math. Machine learning and AI is not a computer. It's a data set. But what and is so, it running like, on top of? What, not, what is it running but what is it running on top it's, of, bro? It's running on top of a computer, but this is what I'm saying is exactly. important. And this is pro- – but most lo- most likely this is what they're doing because I think I've mentioned you know, programs like Dust and like Langchain. What they're doing is they're using these models to take this input from a user. They then translate that into, into like Python or JavaScript in the background, and then they have the computer run the Python or J- JavaScript, and then they interpret that. But that's something they like – they relatively had to hack together because if it's just a language model on top of a computer, the computer understands ones and zeros. You, need, you know what? Hey, Brad, I have a suggestion for you. You need to be a consultant for OpenAI. Let me explain why. Let me explain right. why. They need to be paying. You know, I, you know, you, you know, I'm in a consultant business right now. So yeah, I, <laughs> I bring that up. I, so, I bring sell, that up. sell it right look, now, bro. Look, they have plenty of capital to invest in. Because look, look, one thing you're doing. And the people on your side, and I'm just going to say your side, it's not a war, but the, there's a side of people. Now that it's are, us them, and I'm them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, y'all know a lot about, like, y'all read the papers, y'all read the essays, you know. I've noticed that people that know a lot about AI are not that happy. Like, there's a lot of people that yeah, don't know yeah. about it, and they're they're not that happy, for you know. But here's what they don't understand. Y'all criticism is free game. All y'all do, like, mm-hmm. I'm not getting paid to give them the answers. You need to be a consultant. You have all these criticisms. All they doing is saying, okay, bet. And then they just add that. See, yeah. when I saw them come up with that improvement about the mathematical capabilities, I was like, oh, all they did was hear everybody say, all right, you know, yep. we doing this fucked up. Here's the answer to that. So so you can criticize all day, but you're not even getting paid. That's you're not real. getting paid. That's you're real. Three ideas. Like, like y'all so like like look at I, I think that's the better. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, because there is, like, like, like Drake said, it's so early that there is going to be a million different criticisms. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, it's almost like criticizing like an infant. You know what I'm saying? It's like, exactly. obviously, like, you, you know, like, obviously, bro. he's not going to know how well to fight. Said, bro. That's, yeah, I'm, like, I'm going to keep it a stack. Y'all shut me up. So I'm going to be quiet on that. <laughs> but this also <laughs> shut me up, too. Did get y'all the, see this? Get to the pay. Get to the pay. It, I didn't so, did y'all see this? They in January they reached a hundred million active users. Wait, who's it? But who is this metric shared by? Who who is the Tyler? Who is that person? Uh, it's coming from Reuters. It's coming from Reuters. Did, Tyler, did open, Tyler Cohen. Did open AI confirmed it, or is he part of the open? Let me see. It was based off their similar web traffic. Actually, I remember reading. Yeah, similar web. They had thirteen million. million. They had thirteen million uh-huh. unique visitors a day. A hundred million uh, seemed like web. a. That seemed like a stretch to me. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Close. Well, that's a lot. Yeah. I'm not gonna I can lie. believe close. I can believe close, but a hundred million? Nah. Nah. That'd be one third of the U.S. Man, that's a lot. That's one third of the U.S. <laughs> right. Right. No. Bro, we're I, cap. No. So we're saying cap bro, here. Bro, cap. I, cap. I don't know what I'm saying yet. Let me think about it. Cap. I've been looking at metrics long enough. Cap. Cap. <laughs> <laughs> this is cap. Okay. And if they haven't confirmed it, if, unless they confirm, I want to hear them confirm it. If they confirm it, cool. But if it's I don't just think they would. no, they would. Trust me. A hundred million, bro. A hundred million. You got a hundred million users. You're gonna you're gonna talk about that, bro. You're not gonna you're not gonna be quiet Mark, about that, bro. Drake might have a point. Drake might have a point. They may not actually be trying to confirm it because maybe it's more than what they currently have. Yeah, bro. You know come what I'm on. Saying? Because best believe if somebody came out. And the mm. article went spread, and it was like, there's only 5 million monthly active users. Best believe open AI will come out like, nah, we got more than Correct 5 it. million users. Correct it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. But I'm going to say this too, though. I think just given how open AI has been in the media over just like the last few months, there's been a lot of criti- – like not criticism. There's been a lot of talk around you know different things you know they're tied to, rather if it's like the upcoming release of GPT-4. And how people are talking about the number of parameters and the capabilities or whatever. Them niggas ain't came out and said shit. And I think it goes back to, you know, just once again, the power of the story. And I don't know who's over there running the marketing for OpenAI, but kudos. Because their brand positioning is fucking genius. And the word of mouth behind this thing is just, is really what's propelling them 
to be like synonymous with AI. When the consumer thinks of AI, what do they think of? Chat GPT. Yeah. You don't even they, they hear took, about all the million things that OpenAI is. They need a better name, man. I'm sorry. They, they just it, took a, that a ain't uh, spread fast enough. They took a page out of Elon's book, basically. I mean, Elon kind of did that with Tesla and with SpaceX. I don't think either of them have like a marketing team. I don't think either of them spend any money on marketing. It's all word of mouth with Tesla, right? It's all word of mouth with SpaceX, right? SpaceX ain't running commercials and talking about what rockets they're doing. Like, they're just doing their shit, dropping videos on their social media, like just existing. And people talking about it. So I think like that's just really the power like, mm-hmm. what Elon is able to bring to the table. I mean, I'm not sure if he's the one, one that's bringing it, but I think he is associated with them. He's a co-founder, I believe. One thing we can say, though, whether or not we believe they have 100 million active users per month just yet, we do know that they have broken a lot of records we do know that yeah. they are they are and again i'm still shocked because like i said i can't get over the fact it's called chat gpt i just can't get i can't get past that you know it was a research just, project that thing i know about. but see you don't know no, it was a research project now they're trying to make it a product and so it's like that ain't so you think they should rebrand it you know they like, should rebrand it yeah, no yeah, don't, for example, don't do it said, don't do played, it hold on Dre, oh, well, it's too late now but dre said he pitched for superhuman Okay, he no, he pays for Grammarly, right? Like you don't hear him, you know, paying for, you know, what I'm saying text editor, three point oh, like, 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 like it's just like, come on. Wait, wait, Brian, no. how do you think? Why do you That's... think it's too? Why do you think it's too late to rebrand? Because I don't necessarily think it is. Why do you think it is? Because it's one thing. Once again, if that hundred million number is correct or whatever, cool. I do agree. Like they probably don't have a hundred million people using it, but. They got a lot of people going to their site. And yeah. given that's what is passing now in the conversation, I'm just speaking in, from my experience. Nigga, once upon a time, we had literally a significant amount of the black community, nigga, saying the cookout. We changed that bitch. That's all I'm going to say. Like, yeah. oh, and I, I would hate I for them to experience something like that because once again, it's positioning is about when people think of this who comes to mind chat gpt is coming to mind if anything else like like you said chat bot three i don't know what the fuck they would call like what do you even call it <laughs> whatever they would call it it's not coming to mind <laughs> let's just be real and that's going to yeah. take more work than it needs to be smooth you know and you know what brian i think what it really came down to is that like i do believe that they even though they knew they had a product, I do believe that those people over there are talented people and they're smart individuals. And usually when you have people who are smart and talented, you know, they're not the, they're not the arrogant ones. You know, they're, they're a lot more humble. And I do have a feeling that they, yes, it was just seen as a research project and they weren't really looking at it like some type of product per se. And that would explain, you know, maybe some of the ways that they packaged it, you know. But if they had no, if they, in hindsight, I do believe, if in hindsight, if I was with Sam, I would tell him, look, bro, the product is amazing, bro. But, like, what is GPT exactly? What is? Can you start there? What is <laughs> GPT? Right? <laughs> like, let's just start there, please. And then we can go from there about, like, what do we call it, right? It, you know, but... High size 2020, so I don't want to get too caught up on it. I'm yeah. just saying, when I talk and I tell people, you know, it, I get reluctant because I'm like, because as soon as you say GPT, like, it just starts seeming like you're talking about some high level tech shit. And it's no, like, you are. I know, but you don't have to be, though. You don't That's have, true. Because like, literally, there are kids in middle school using this, there are kids in high school using this. So it is, you are talking about high level stuff, but it don't, it didn't have to be that way. But I'm going to say this. So two things, two things. One, I honestly think it's positive that if you're a kid in middle school and you're being exposed to chat GPT, I hope you are curious and you go Google what the fuck GPT means. I hope Mm -hmm. it leads you down that rabbit hole of just learning a little bit more. Like you don't have to go all the way deep into the weeds, but no, because right now, a lot of the AI that we've experienced has been abstracted away. Think about it. Products we use like TikTok, Facebook, Google ads, et cetera, extracted away. We're not even aware. About mm-hmm. to be right in front of our face. And Dre has said this before. You got to trust and verify. And only to be able to verify, you need to have an understanding of what the fuck you're using. So that's point number one. 
The sec the second point is this. I think moving forward, they're going to operate from the perspective of a business as a company. And honestly, I think the name open AI is very fucking deceiving now because it's really closed AI. Where in the beginning, they did start off very open. They were, you know, releasing these research papers and all the details. They were releasing all their models via open source. Nigga, guess what? We can't go read shit on GPT. I don't know how the fuck that shit work. Yeah, yeah. And so I, that's I what I like. I think it, I think there there is this identity shift that is probably occurring with their company where it's like, cool. And it, which it needs to happen because for too long, AI has been in the back because it's been research based where now it's becoming, you know, capitalism is taking over. Yeah, the problem with it before is that it just like, it's like even like had a similar problem to crypto where it's like, you could talk about all these technologies and how like how powerful they are, but like you don't just have like a simple application for it for yeah. somebody to use it in their real life as a useful tool. Like it's almost like they don't like nobody cares, you know. So so let me, but let me let's go a little bit further actually because this conversation reminded me of, of something I saw last night. Sam Altman tweeted something about uh, essentially there's a lot of heat, you know, coming to OpenAI right now, and you know he essentially said you know attack. You know, attack me all you want, but just don't talk. Don't attack the employees that are at, on our team. They're good people, blah, 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 et cetera, right? He's standing up for his team, right? And, but here's the topic, though. A lot of conservatives are very upset that there is bias in open AI. Now, I will get to explaining a little bit more about this real quick. So I'll also add in real quick something that David Sachs had mentioned, because this is all going to tie together. You know, David Sachs is a entrepreneur and investor. He also has made some movies. I don't know which ones, but he, and he also, he also runs the All In podcast. He tweeted about essentially, you know, how we underestimated social engineering in the sense of the actual biases are being built into the code, right? And before I get to the open AI thing, I wanted to address something about David Sachs. And if he hears this, cool, David, I'm going to be real with you. This is exactly what people are talking about. Minorities, whether they're Hispanics, you know, Asians, Blacks, you know, women, you know, gay, whatever. This is exactly what they're talking about. It just doesn't seem that way. What I mean by that is David is basically saying the bias is being built into the code, right? The infrastructure of the Internet. When people in the real world talk about systemic discrimination, systemic racism, that's the exact same thing. Things were architected a certain way in our, things were architected a certain way and it created situations in which case some people benefit more than others. Now, mind you, it's important to understand the system. It won't hold you back if you can understand how to Use the system to your advantage. Let's just bring this back, though, to Sam real quick. Conservatives are upset. And by the way, as far as I know, David has been paid in it as a conservative, and which is the reason why he comes out and he sees this, right? And he, see, and he says something about it. But they're upset because there's a lot of bias in the way that it replies to political type of questions and also, like, just the way that it, it, it typically has liberal leaning stance on a lot of, you know, props, right? And I'll be honest with you guys. I am, I have not, I'm not a conservative. I would, to be honest, I'll consider myself moderate because there are things on the conservative side that make sense to me. For example, I do believe everybody should have the right to have a gun. That's one simple thing, but I've been on the liberal side my entire life. I live in California. It's a, the mo one of the most progressive states in, in, in America. Here's the thing though. I did notice though that like, and it was hard, it was weird because it was very slight. And this is the same thing when you like look in the real world with like a systemic bias, it's always a little slight, but I remember asking certain questions and they did seem like they, the underlying beliefs and assumptions had a, had roots in certain political beliefs. And I don't re even remember their exact prompts. When I saw this, it didn't shock me. So I guess right now what they are saying is, okay, we're going to, we made a mistake, right? And so we're going to like train it on other views that are not just, you know, just on liberal leaning, right? And here's the thing though. We know in history though, that's always happening. It's like, like at what point are people going to realize 
that, yes, you're going to make mistakes as long as there's not enough diversity to start with. You know, like, like because everybody didn't see an issue until people who had different beliefs saw it, right? Mm-hmm. Like, so that's the thing. It doesn't matter whether you're, whether we're talking about gender, race, or whatever it is. And in this case, it's, po- it's politics. And that begs the question now, can we trust open AI to make sure that they are training in a fair way? Training the data sets in a fair way. They're not just focusing on, and here's the thing, Sam mentioned how it is hard to do that because you don't want to have beliefs that are like, you know, dangerous to society. And the thing is though, it's very difficult because politics has a lot of philosophical beliefs on different sides. And so it's very difficult. So I want to leave the floor open to you guys just to talk about this, but it does beg the question, can we trust OpenAI to train it on more? Because they're going to fix the political problem. But what about other sets of information that they might be missing because they don't have maybe the diversity on the team? No, I don't think... Go ahead, brother. I'll let you go. I'll let you go. Okay. Nah, you're speaking facts, bro. You are really speaking facts. And so the reason why I want to pull this up is because... I don't think she gets enough credit. She called this shit out. Literally, this was an article that she, so a little background about who Joel, I can't pronounce her last name, Bula Wani. She's a research at the MIT Media Lab studying specifically AI and artificial intelligence. And she wrote this article back in 2018 that caught a lot of hype around it. But I really think started this movement where, you know, what, this was just a few years ago. Someone in the AI department at Google, who's a person of color, ended up getting like, you know, calling stuff out about bias and ended up being let go. But she called this exact problem out. And I think what she was saying was extremely important. And going back to like, you know, just these systems and the bias that they have. At the end of the day, I don't think we would ever be able to absolutely trust them. I don't. And the reason why I don't is, this is the thing. Data is an input. It's not an output. It, it, and so it, it is being it is being ingested instead of being spewed back out, right? And what I mean by that is the data that, it, that these systems are like collecting, the data that is being created whenever this content is being created, it is being inputted by who? Humans. And humans have created in this natural world a lot of systems that are biased. And I think that just, we, we, I don't know why all of a sudden it's something new, but I'm even thinking about like social media and how over the past decade, the conversation has been around like these ideas of these echo chambers, right? And like, they actually, I feel like you talked about this recently on the podcast too, Rodney, when you had mentioned like Mastodon and things of that nature. But my point is this, it's going to be a tough problem to solve. And I think it's unrealistic to assume it can be. I do think there needs to be a conversation around what does, you know, equity and, you know, all that look like, you know, within data, just because it's going to require us to come up with a world that does not exist now. It can't. So, so yes. And I want Dre to go, but, before, but real quick, Dre, before you go, I have an analogy. I understand what you're saying. Island, and I also agree. There's no such thing as a perfect solution in this case. When it comes to biases, there's no such thing. We all have them. We all act on them. We know this is just true. They're called blind spots, right? One thing, let's keep in mind something, right? When you are driving on the road and say you're in the middle lane and you want to turn to your left or your right, you're supposed to look in your left side mirror and you're all supposed to check what? your blind spot. Now, what I'm saying is that do we trust people to be, to actively look for their blind spots? That's more so what I'm trying to get out there. Now, you know, like whether or not it it turns perfect, that's cool. But we all, if we all accept that we have blind spots, then we just need to make sure that we are checking those blind spots in the same way when you're driving a car, you're multiple, you turn on your right signal, you look to your right mirror, and then also you look over through your right side, your blind spot, to just double check that you have a full picture before you make that turn. So I just wanted to throw that out there real quick. 
Yeah, no, I think y'all touched on that. I have nothing else to add to it. Like, I to to Brian's point, I don't think this is ever a solvable thing. And ironically, I gotta, I want to read that article you were just bringing up, but it reminded me. I have a friend. I'll drop it in a group um, chat. Yeah, I have a friend who used to run a facial recognition company out of Florida, and I think it was maybe around 2018, 2017. It was right around that time, maybe even a little bit before that. I went down there. Rodney was actually with me as well. We were in Miami. And we went by their office. The name of the company is called Kairos. And we went by their office and he was showing us like the facial recognition tech. And this tech basically used facial tracking. Like it was facial tracking software. So it could like detect emotion in your face. It could detect gender. It could detect age. It could detect different things about you based on just your face. I mean, it was really impressive technology. Like we were blown away. But one of the really big concerns at that time and this is a black founder, by the way, that started this company. But one of the big concerns that he had at that time was definitely the biases to get baked into some of these models, particularly like some of these bigger companies like Google. And I know that was something that like they were really passionate about working on. And so while I agree, like we'll never be able to solve this, there are definitely people in this. There are definitely people in the space. I'm glad those people exist in the space who are taking this more serious and are starting to step up. Because one thing you said, Brian, I kind of disagree with you said data is an input not an output, the reality is people make decisions based on the output of data, right? And so when we look at historically, like the biases that have been built in, in, in systems that exist today, whether it's housing, like I'm in a process right now trying to buy more, like trying to buy a house. So whether it's like housing or whether it's credit, right? Whether it's all those different systems that already exist, people are making decisions off of that data that exists today. And that data is already built based off of biases, right? And so you're taking that data and yeah, you are using it as an input, but you're starting with a biased data set from the beginning. And so it, I don't think, you know, I just, I don't think you'll ever be able to solve that problem. It's really, a, it's a human problem. It's a, it's a natural problem. But again, I do think like there should be some, there's some things that we can do, but I don't think it's ever hundred proof. And hopefully like open AI is like leading that, that way, because like, like y'all have already touched on, when you think about AI today, you think about open AI, right? And so that automatically gives them a responsibility, just like Google had that responsibility or has that responsibility. Facebook has that responsibility. Like all these big tech companies have that responsibility. So yeah. let, me, let me hit on that real quick. Okay. Is I would agree with you if it wasn't. Yeah, I, where I disagree is I don't think that's how thinking agents, like think about how you make a decision. Yes, there are outputs out there. And, you know, that you quote unquote, but those outputs are essentially inputs that are then processed by your brain. And then your decision is a new output. Right. And if you think about machine learning and these models, that is essentially what is happening with this data. And so that's just my perspective when it comes to like the bias in the data is like, because that's how they're replicating this thing to work just like the mind. That's so one the of the issues. Is who's mind? The question is who's mind? Who's mind? Like who's mind, right? Like also, but let me add something. Cause I know we're, we we are getting, you know, close towards the, you know, hour here, but I want to add something to, cause Dre brought up something definitely that's very important. You know, we did have a friend who was building this facial recognition technology. I'm not going to lie back then that shocked me. I mean, I remember the demo. And just like yeah. it reading my whole face, and I just it's like this is crazy, you know. And you know, and we all know that there's there's, there's a lot that comes with, you know, concerns that comes with technology like that, right? For example, if anybody has been in too recent Lakers game, you know, look at the top of the of the scoreboard. There's these new dynamic cameras. The camera is on the ball at all times. Whoever has the ball, and it's not just swiveling left and right. It's going up and down, diagonal. Like it's advanced, right? And so mm. we can already expect those type of things to start appearing in our everyday lives with the addition of these technologies. What I'll further say is this, we can't make a perfect solution. What we can do is create certain types of tests. And I'm just gonna throw one idea, cause we're not gonna spend all like for unlimited time here. Look, one idea is this, let's say you have, let's just say you have a gender for both race and I'll start by saying this. There is statistically more young men and young boys that have ADHD, for example, right? But in the psychology field, it's been mentioned that could potentially be because it's easier to spot it in young boys than it would be in young 
women, right? And so they manifested differently, right? And so, so keep that idea of manifesting certain behaviors differently for this example. Let's just say you have, like I said, a man and a woman from every race, right? And you are trying to build a technology that determines like almost like intent. Like does somebody have an intent to commit a crime? Are they about to do something? Are they aggressive? Are they passive, et cetera? All these things, right? Re reading people, right? Before this technology becomes live, what should be done is there should be actors, literally actors hired for all these races and all these genders. It's not that one, it's not that many. And they should test the technology on these actors. And what I'm saying is, for example, you tell these actors, look, you tell the woman, act aggressive. You tell the man, act aggressive. And you do that for every race. And then you get all the results of what the technology spits out as its output based on what it saw the actors do, right? And then you look at that. And if you start to see significant differences, for example, one of the easiest ones as black men in America would be potentially we could be seen as more aggressive than we are actually being in real life. Meaning that the perception of our aggression is higher because of stereotypes, because of things that have been reinforced. And that doesn't mean though, that for example, a young woman is not aggressive because she doesn't look aggressive in the way that we see it in a black man or even like an Indian man or whatever. So we need to be able to see those scores and have like like a like almost like a board that can say, okay, these things are picking up different things despite the fact we told all these actors to act the same way. Like and so and you'll if you do that test enough, you'll see the differences between what is reading in races and genders. And then from there, I don't know what's next, so but that is starting place for trying to determine, okay, when it says that this type of person is being, you know, passive, are they really being passive or are they just like, maybe it's their gender and the aggression is coming out in a different way, you know? And so being a little bit more closer, you know, and adjusting the values with some type of, you know, constant values to make to, to offset things given that we know there are certain biases already. Now that's like one step, and there's plenty of other ways that it could be approached. That's just one thing I wanted to throw out there because I know that we're, you know, we're wrapping up here. No, so a few things real quick. So what you just explained is reinforcement learning, which is basically just saying like, hey, this is what the computer did. Human, is that correct or not? And then feeding that back in there so it can be more correct. But I 100% agree with you on that. But my second point is this, at least in terms of the example that you use, and it's very important because it has consequences in terms of how these models work, right, is when it comes to data, I know we've been talking about data broadly, but when it comes to these models, the model is separating the data into, in, in basically into two different types. The first one is discrete and the other one is continuous. So you can think of like race, it's very discrete. You know that there's black, except whatever sh pops up under those fields. Where if you think about something such as like what chat GPT is doing, where it's creating text or it's creating images, right? Which there's an infinite number of possibilities in terms of how those can be constructed. That data is more continuous, right? And the different, the reason why this is important is because what these models are doing is when you have a model that is predicting something that is discrete, it gives you something absolute. When you have something that is giving you something that is continuous, it gives you probabilities. And so going back to what you were saying about, if we're sp speaking specifically about chat GPT, the reason why what you just explained is very important is because hopefully we can show it enough correct examples to where now when it has these probabilities and it's choosing the thing with the highest probability, it's because it has seen that enough to say, okay, I think when you say this, you want this. And it's because I have seen this outcome enough. And so that's one thing, but I'm lie. Go ahead. Yeah, real, we really got uh, gotten into it, which we can't because we're, it's, it, could, it can get real yeah. deep. Mm -hmm. I, I, that alone just got me to another point of which where it could, where we can find some solutions, but yeah, yeah. one company I want to reach. So talk about it. Well, I'm just going to mention when we can talk about it later, but a company that I recommend y'all check out, they were actually spun out of OpenAI, and they ended up closing a big round recently is Anthropic. 
So they're actually getting ready to roll out their cloud. It's called Cloud AI. It's literally a chat GPT like competitor. And they've been doing like small beta tests and the wait list is somewhere on Twitter. I can send it to y'all if y'all are interested. But what they have based it on is simply what we've been talking about, like around bias and some of these other issues and how they have went about solving it is through a method that they call constitutional AI. So it's basically programming the AI to have a set number of principles that when it does have, you know, produced this output before it gives the final output to the user, it's saying does this align with the values of this model? And so that's one of the solutions that's being created right now. And that, that spun out of OpenAI. I don't right. even trust our own. One day, I don't even trust our own. Give you a whole episode. They're like, oh, Berlin, we're going to need to give you a whole episode. Like just where you just go in and we just sit back because you brought up a paper. You brought up an essay. You brought up a <laughs> research paper in the podcast. Ain't nobody looking at that shit, bro. Ain't nobody looking at that shit, bro. Hey, bro, I'm reading that these. Is. I'm reading these before bed, bro. <laughs> hey. I can see that. Hey. You know what you're talking about. Hey, as they say, you can bring the horse to water, but you can't make him drink it. Rylan, right? Rylan bringing all the. He bringing everybody into the water. So hey, it's up to us to take the sip. So hey, we're gonna drop the links water. in the. Hey, we're gonna drop the link in the description. Whoever's gonna pick it up is gonna pick it up. But like <laughs> always, man, we stay dropping gems. This is a good episode. So let's wrap no, it up. No, this was we'll, good. We'll bring it back. Rodney, next you week. got me thinking on some things, man. I'm glad. Well, you got me thinking. Trust me. Trust me. We we trust. Me. You got me thinking as well. But we'll we'll save it for the next one, guys. Yep. Right, Stay man. up, fellas. One, All right, guys. Two.